All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining tonight's webinar. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Shine, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we are joined by Dr. Nathan Suter, who will discuss maximizing your clinical schedule with teledentistry. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will cover as many as we can at the end of the webinar. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental, and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. Dr. Suter is a private practice dentist and owner, as well as consultant and owner of Access Teledentistry. So with that, thanks for being with us, Dr. Suter. Take it away. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate everyone coming and uh, sitting through this webinar after a full day here. And so what I'm going to get into today is uh, I'm going to get into how I use teledentistry um, as we start to adapt uh, in a, um, a world where we're living with COVID. So um, we're going to get into what people are calling the hybrid practice model. And so uh, I'm going to go into detail how I use my uh I have a practice, Greenleaf Dental Care. I, I do um, have a small practice, and uh, I use teledentistry to um, supplement my schedule and my availability to my patients. So um, my, a little bit about my background. I am a, a, have a business degree from Webster University in St. Louis. I went to the University of Missouri, Kansas City uh, Dental School, and I was a dental director at a community health center uh, for was there for about six years. Uh, started a community health center, grew it to a, um, a large group practice with uh, around 12 dentists in six locations. Uh, also, I'm the chair, the current chair of the Missouri Coalition for Oral Health. Um, and with all my advocacy around teledentistry and, and things like that, and projects and pilot programs that I've helped. Uh, with organizations in Missouri, I've um, gotten a number of awards from the ADA and the MDA. And most recently, I uh, have a uh, consulting company that I formed just to help people that have been asking me lots of questions about presenting and, and how I implemented uh, teledentistry, both at the health center at my private practice. So uh, with that, we'll go into the new normal, as everyone calls it. And uh, uh, if I still have marks on my face from my mask, uh, that's because I was looking something like that um, in, in the clinic today. And we'll start with a little bit of 101 on teledentistry. So I know some people that join us today are new to teledentistry. And so we'll get a little bit into just nuts and bolts, and then I'll get into it a little further. Um, so there was a spike uh, in interest of teledentistry across the country after COVID. Um, and it seems to be hitting a new kind of uh, level of awareness that's higher than before COVID, but not at the peak of, of March or April that, that we were experiencing. Um, you also might have noticed that the Health Policy Institute at the American Dental Association has been studying people's use of uh, teledentistry. Um, and so they are doing a bi-weekly economic impact uh, polling. And um, what they found when they polled people in April um, mid to late April was that about a quarter of dentists were using teledentistry. Um, and then uh, by, by specialty, um, it was getting adopted uh, at a much higher rate around almost 50% in pediatrics, 40% uh, in ortho, um, oral surgery around 30%, and general practitioners uh, still around a quarter. Um, but um, what we found since then uh, and oh, and health centers too. So at, at the FUHCs at the health centers around the country, um, there was around 50%, 58% of health centers using teledentistry, both in uh, May, but also um, later on at the end of June. Um, and so while health centers, it seemed to have stuck a little bit in private pra practices, uh, it's dropped down to around 12% of practices that are being polled. However, um, I have a caveat to add to that because this question that, they, that they're really asking at the ADA Health Policy Institute is whether or not you're using virtual technology or communications to do D0140 triaging or limited exams. They're not asking for any other applications of teledentistry that you may consider, okay? And what I've found um, 
being the person that goes around and talks to people about teledentistry and listens to questions. I get emails from across the country, uh, different people trying different things, doing different things. Is there's more under the hood if you looked uh, a little further that, of what's going on. And some initial pulling that, that I've been doing um, with practices around the country um, is that, uh, and, and I've got an ongoing survey. If anybody would like to take it, I, I'd be happy to uh, send you guys a link. Um, uh, what we are uh, looking at here is that of the people that are doing teledentistry, um, which is around half of the people that I've been polling have been using teledentistry, over 50% of them are in a you know neutral to highly likely uh, position of trying to implement further how they're using teledentistry in different ways. Um, and also, um, what we're finding out is that the same goes for people that aren't using teledentistry, would they consider doing it in the future? Um, and there is uh, there is an inclination that they're interested. It's just not the right time for them. And so pretty interesting. You also notice that uh, quite a bit of people are using it for other procedures. So using it for their hygiene appointments, which we'll get into later in the presentation, um, and quite a bit of people doing it for post-op follow-up visits, uh, just to follow up with uh, patients. So like I said, the uh, HPI polling is showing uh, a decrease in limited triaging, but I think out there, there's somewhere between uh, what the health centers have going on and what um, what, we, what we're seeing in the practice, uh, other practices. So what I like to do when I talk about teledentistry is the fact that there's multiple applications. And I, I've tried to boil it down in, into eight different applications. You've got limited evaluation and triage, which is what the HBI uh, folks have been pulling about. Um, which, which is what people have been rushing to do when COVID first hit, we were all in lockdown. Then you have uh, the use of hygiene assessments. So you, uh, utilizing your hygiene department uh, to uh, a higher capability than you would normally use them for. Uh, and at the same goes for satellite office coverage. So there's a little bit, a lot of overlap between application two and application three, but essentially with, with teledentistry, you can run multiple offices using teledentistry um, for hygiene coverage um, while you're not located physically in the same place. Um, the next is for treatment plan consultations, uh, specialist consultations, um, and then the most, the previous to COVID, the typical application that I was consulting people on, on was how to do outreach programs and use tele, teledentistry to extend outside your practice walls and into the community and going to places like a nursing home or senior center or assisted living facility, um, maybe a school, things like that. And then there's some other applications that are getting tested around the country, which are pretty interesting, like uh, embedding someone from your team in a, in a health facility. Um, so doing some medical dental integration at the hospital um, or at a health department or something to that effect. And then finally, a little more uh, far flung of an idea possibly is using it for patient monitoring. So this happens a lot in medical and, and uh, when people are discharged from the hospital, they are connected to devices to track them and monitor them. And there is a lot of potential in this space that we'll probably see continue to grow in the future. But for today's discussion, um, and going forward, we really only have two main terms to describe how we're doing it um, in our practice. And so with teledentistry, you have synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous is like Zoom right now, where you're actually doing a video conference with a, a patient. Um, and then the second would be asynchronous, which is, means um, someone in your in your uh office, whether it's the dental hygienist or in some states, an expanded function dental assistant, they're actually going to record patient record data, store that information to be reviewed at a later time. The doctor reviews all the clinical data notes and comes up with a treatment plan at a different place or time. So that is called asynchronous. Um, and both of those have different codes. Now, those codes are only for uh, administrative purposes in most states and most insurance plans. So they are not a new code um, except for in a few states. 
So they are a code that the insurance companies want you to put to indicate that you're doing teledentistry, but you would also do your diagnostic uh, codes for that visit on top of doing your teledentistry code. Now, the next thing uh, that I'd like to go into is just a few legal definitions uh, of terminology that you need to incorporate into your notes if you're going to do teledentistry. So um, you need to include your originating site, which is where the patient is located, your distance site, which is where the dentist is located, and then you also need to record your patient presenter. So um, if you're going to talk to your patient at their house, you're going to, in your note, indicate that the patient is their own presenter. Um, and then also you're going to, if you're in your office and you're, you're not there that day, your hygienist would be your patient presenter. So we'll get just a briefly into a little policy and regulation. I got just a little bit of guidance for you here. The ADA uh, has made a lot of resources. Um, myself and Dr. Glassman help put together some uh, documents that are on their website. So there's a provider guide, some re resources for technology, um, as well as some uh, earlier webinars that we did. And then as far as regulations for your state and uh, any legal considerations you need to uh, stay on top of, I recommend the Center for Connected Health Policy. It is a, a government funded nonprofit that is solely there to help providers across the country understand the rules for their state. And so they've got a great team there. They're very responsive. Feel free to ask them for any advice on what your state may have specific. And it's good to go with an organization like them because their job is to track it. And a lot of stuff with COVID has been changing uh, temporarily or permanently a lot of the rules and regulations around telehealth. So definitely check them out. Also some notes about HIPAA. There has been some relaxed HIPAA compliance uh, uh, rulings from the federal government. And uh, there have been some inclinations that they're going to in, be expanding this for a while um, from um, HHS. And so these are some uh, quotes and some links that show you what HHS said about how you can use, if you're using technology and you want to try getting access to your patients during, during the pandemic, you can use things that are um, maybe not your typical HIPAA compliant choices to get you up and running and get you comfortable with the system. Um, also, uh, there's also some DEA um, guidelines that were issued. If you are considering doing teledentistry and you have to provide a narcotic to a patient, um, you must do a synchronous communication. They will not uh, count an asynchronous communication uh, when you're doing teledentistry um, and you're prescribing an opiate. Also, there's a great coding and billing guide that the uh, ADA put together. Um, it is really only there to tell you about uh, that limited evaluation and triage usage of teledentistry. Um, if you are uh, looking for some further uh, guidelines or templates, I did put some together on my website that are kind of similar where it kind of goes into some scenarios. Feel free to go to that if you'd like, um, or if you can't find it, you know, feel free to shoot me a message we could get that to you. So there's also the, the, the fact that most states that offer teledentistry require informed consent. So you need to go into um, your, you need to get a document put together that shows that the, that the patient realizes that they're getting a teledentistry visit. And so um, that has been a mainstay for medical, doing medical telemedicine. And so that's carried over to us. So you need to have a consent form just for teledentistry um, uh, prepared. And the ADA does have it in the guide uh, a draft for you to use. So uh, we'll start with a couple different applications of teledentistry. We're, we're going to focus on three mainly today. Um, and then I'll get into how I'm using it in my practice. So the first is limited evaluation triage. So that's what people think of first when they think of teledentistry. Um, what I do is I do all, of, I have the patient schedule a video conference with me and they fill out a set standard form and I get that ahead of time. And my goal is to always try to asynchronously complete the triage without having to get on a Zoom call. Okay, 
uh, Zoom calls are very, or, or whatever video conference solution you would use. So um, video conferencing can be a, a very big uh, um, time waste. So if you can look at a set standard question, set of questions and triage the problem and maybe message the patient a couple times, then you're not having to, you don't have to sync up your schedule with the patient and go through um, uh, a longer visit when you could on a percentage of these knock out and figure out uh, pretty quickly what, what the plan needs to be. Just for triaging, you're not going to get a definitive diagnosis doing this kind of thing. It is just a tool to um, help you guide and create just a little bit of mit risk mitigation for your practice um, to, to, to screen a patient before they, they come physically into the office. So here's an example. This is my website for my practice. Um, there's a button right there that patients click and they can book a teledentistry exam and then um, they can uh, find a time for a synchronous that works in their schedule. So uh, they go and they click, click on a date and time that works for them. I get a notification that they booked it and uh, they get this form that they fill out. It's my consent form and everything all combined into one. Um, they they go through all of that and then they um, they uh, submit it to me and I get it ahead of time. I get an email saying it's filled out. Now um, you have uh, the limited evaluation uh, options. Like I said, you have the option to do synchronous, um, but my goal is to always do an asynchronous visit um, as much as possible. Okay, so synchronous needs to be scheduled. You'll need a third party platform and this takes more time. If you have asynchronous, um, you need a way to organize and not lose track of the patients that submitted you stuff. Okay, so you need a queue or a list of patients. Um, and then you it may require a third party platform. I do most of my stuff right there in Dentrix. Um, and then I, uh, and I, I do use a, uh, the synchronous if I need to. Okay, but if someone's sending a digital form and your digital form system should be able to give it to you um, and then you can message the patient, okay? Or have, sometimes my staff, my staff always has a follow-up call after I review asynchronous information. So next we'll get in the hygiene assessment and satellite office coverage. So the, the goal, the, the, the thing for this is it's a, it's a risk mitigation tool while you're, you're also expanding your hygiene practice, okay? So if you're like me, you had weeks and weeks and weeks of pent up uh, hygiene demand. And right now my hygiene, you know, is booked out pretty far. I'm trying to catch back up, people wanting to get back in. And uh, what, what teledentistry allows you to do is reduce human to human contact, essentially. So not as many people in the same room with each other, uh, not as much PPE getting used. Um, you, have the, you can have the patients wait outside um, and you can operate um, your office with people spaced out uh, a little better. And I'll get into how I'm doing it in my office. Um, it also creates a little more availability for your patients. So if, if, if your schedule is only limited to when you're physically present, it limits your recovery um, from COVID and your um, availability to just that, okay? But if you have you know, a couple nights a week or a night a week even that you're open three more hours, um, you can do that with fellow dentistry um, if your state allows that. So the caveat to hygiene assessments is there's probably a dozen to um, almost 20 states that this is a, a legal to do it in. And if not, you've got, got some advocacy efforts that needs to be done to do that. So my hygienist also does triage with, uh, I do in-person hygienist teledentistry triage with my hygienist. So my hygienist actually gets patients that break a filling or whatever, and my schedule's full. They can come in sooner and get an x-ray with her. Um, we kind of tell them that it's an, uh, a quick x-ray and Dr. Suter will review it and figure out if it, you know, is something that he needs to bring on his schedule or if it's something that um, he needs to refer out. So that is a new way of using your hygienist than normal, but the hygienist, uh, if you have a very well calibrated dental hygienist that's worked with you for a while, works out great. I, I've worked with the same hygienist for five years. Also having this kind of system is really, really in line with OSHA guidance uh, on preparing your workplaces. So um, 
For example, if that patient is the person with, uh, that is COVID positive, if you have half the amount of people in the office because you're using hygiene access outside of when the dentist is there, that's half the amount of doc- staff and patients that are in contact um, for contact tracing. Um, so that's less people have to contact and follow up with and if there is a potential exposure in the office. If you're gonna do hygiene assessments, there's some things to consider. Um, so I typically use um, these sets of, uh, my hygienist will she'll, uh, use these cameras and retractors and mirrors to capture a standard photo series on top of the regular charting um, and x-rays that she would do, okay? So this is uh, one case of a patient. So full mouth series of x-rays, if it's a teledentistry patient and they've been, been in here before, then they get um, they get uh, just their bite wings, the PA is updated. We have a, a decision tree created that I've created to walk them through what kinds of x-rays to take, um, depending on what the patient has uh, problem-wise. Um, then we do a standard uh, photo series. This is a photo series for this patient. Um, and then if there are susp- teeth with suspicious lesions, the hygienist is taking intraoral f- close-up photos of those teeth. Um, I threw this in there. This is a different patient, but this is uh, what Dr. Howell does um, at the ATSU School of Dentistry in Arizona. Uh, he teaches his dental students to use the intraoral camera to take quadrant uh, videos. So they do video tours of the mouth. So this is just to illustrate that there's different ways to, to define what you want to use as what as the, the level of diagnostic information that you feel comfortable and that you feel you need to complete a dental exam. Another option would be um, using uh, digital scans. So these are some uh, digital scans of that same patient. Um, and a lot of the digital scanners these days have beautiful imagery that can capture a lot of data for you so that you can get a, uh, intraoral pictures are great, but a zoomed out and photo of the entire mouth really helps with the decision-making process and can help you uh, more, more easily orient to the problems whenever there's certain teeth that have issues. Okay, and then of course, if they're an adult, we're gonna have a perio chart. Um, and then we're gonna have the odontogram. Uh, what my hygienist is trained to do is she marks uh, suspicious lesions or teeth with uh, symptoms and things like that um, by using the conditions in, uh, I use D7. So she marks, you can see those areas in black. She's marking things that are, that are suspicious so that I have a visual indicator when I go to do the exam that there's something she either wrote a note about or that there's a picture of um, so that I can cross-reference those things together so that I can make a decision, okay? So this is an example of how um, she layers on the condition codes. Um, and so you can create c- condition codes in there yourself to, to be a specific or, um, or, or to cover whatever ty- types of uh, ways you want to review your charting. And then that is uh, uh, it for the uh, hygiene part, okay? The next part I want to get into is application of synchronous treatment plan consultations, okay? So I don't have a whole lot here. Um, I just started uh, doing this in my practice recently, but I'm finding it a lot of people are, are doing these sorts of things, um, is using, using a synchronous visit for follow-up calls and reviewing treatment plans with people. Um, when instead of having them come in and sit in the office, you could do a Zoom call. So um, there's no need, there's a lot of times not a need for them to come in. Sometimes there are people that are just sitting on the fence anyway. So you're saving time, you're saving um, potential exposure, um, and uh, you schedule them for a synchronous visit. Um, you can, when you do that, you would send them a link to schedule the online visit. Um, you could send them a treatment plan. My recommendation is to send them a treatment plan with no more than three options. People get overwhelmed if there's more than three options. So stick with three uh, options that are kind of somewhat, uh, you get the verbiage down to as least information as possible because they can't understand all the technical terms we use. So try to create nice, short and sweet um, 
layouts of the treatment options for you to review with them. And then you could send them some video links of those things. Hey, here's some single tooth replacement options. Once you do that for a couple of people, you're going to have single tooth replacement options emails ready to go. Um, and you can um, also, I'd recommend you put in a little quick survey to the patient that asks them what their goals are their, so that you know what kind of outcomes they're expecting. Okay. And then you can have go in to this consult with them, knowing a little bit about what you think is possible, but also knowing that the patients reviewed it and you guys can meet there. Instead of you spending 10 minutes on the on the synchronous visit, kind of calib getting on the same page, you can kind of give them some information, give them some, find some YouTube videos or some good education material that you send them. And then you can come into the console ready to go. Okay. Uh, I even recommend that you prepare a slide deck. So put a little slide deck together for some of your, your uh, previous cases that are and maybe some graphical um, structures that show you what uh, those different treatment options could look like. Okay, so as you're going in, a lot, you know, a very common one would be the single tooth replacement or you know, full arch um, edentulous patient. Start to have those slide decks made with um, treatment options, and then pictures of treatment options. And even better if you have pictures of what you've done and some Facebook reviews that you've put on there. So. Go ahead and um, do that, and that and that would be help you with actually using the synchronous consultation as your way to do um, follow up calls. Now, the other way you could use follow up calls is used is and I have patients schedule synchronous follow up calls um, whenever they've had a uh, procedure done. So, um, if they are having some lingering um, questions or some lingering um, symptoms, and they want to check in with me. I have them schedule a synchronous call. I kind of talk to them, see what's going on. Um, I also send them uh, ahead of time a form to fill out again so I can get something. So I enter the, the uh, conversation with some actual data so that I can actually uh, start the conversation off uh, and, and get to the point of what they're looking for. So this next section that we'll get into is uh, adapt is my... I, I encourage you to adapt by embracing the technology that we have. Um, there, <clears throat> it, it, what, what we're noticing from the HPI polling is that we aren't able, uh, with our uh, new guidelines of dentistry, we are not as easily able to accommodate the maximum amount of patients that we did pre-COVID. And so there's been some great polling from um, HPI that shows that uh, before COVID, there was a maximum in private practice, for example, of let's say 32 patients, according to this analysis that they had, and that the current maximum is, 20, is 23 um, across all the respondents uh, in the survey, but that the average is around 20, okay? So how do you make up for those eight to 10 patients uh, a day? Well, I'm gonna tell you that if you, uh, you tell the industry, you can get a little bit higher, okay? And I'll show you what I've been doing in my practice. Um, there's lots of different types of visits when you actually do teledentistry, okay? So like I said, there are two types of modalities, okay? Those are synchronous visits and asynchronous visits, all right? But within those types of, of methodologies, you actually have different ways you can implement the teledentistry visit, okay? So if you have your hygienist communicating to a dentist, they can do help you triage limited evaluation patients. They can help bring in new patients. They can help do definitely do uh, recalls of both adult and children, okay? And then for asynchronous visits, you can also be receiving information directly from a patient, okay? So Patients that want a second opinion that might have went to another office, have them send you that stuff and fill out a questionnaire before they come in. Okay, um, if they've uh, you've had a patient uh, like in COVID, you have a limited evaluation where they send you um, symptoms that they're having and some pictures. Okay, and then synchronous visits. Some applications for that would be having consults like we talked about, but also having patient to patient follow up calls. Um, or follow up calls after they visited the specialist and they kind of have some, you know, you, I, I came in, I was in pain, I got this tooth out, and I really want to know. I didn't, you told me there was a few things I could do. 
I, I really wanted to talk about those options because I can't go without missing my tooth. Well, that person's great for a follow-up call uh, on, on a synchronous visit, right? So those are just, this is just a graphical way to implement, uh, to, to illustrate that there's lots of different ways of looking at teledentistry. It's not just a, a, a synchronized face-to-face uh, video chat with somebody um, all day long. It's not about that. And so in my, you can think about it this way. So there's an efficiency to thinking about teledentistry differently than what uh, many people entered into teledentistry with. So a lot of people's entry into teledentistry was synchronized visits um, with the patient and the doctor from the patient's smartphone. Okay. And so if you think of it that way, um, if you're primarily focused on synchronous evaluations, that feels a lot like the old normal, okay? Because the doctor gets to talk to you, okay? Um, and just a few things might be asynchronous if you have that kind of mindset when you go to do teledentistry. But if you shift your th- way of thinking and can f- find ways to fit asynchronous teledentistry into your practice, you can become f- much more efficient and get your volume back up to where you need it to be so that you're making sure you're <laughs> meeting your margins of costs and you're able to run your practice um, uh, as efficiently as you can and provide for you, your staff and your and, and the best patient care that you possibly can. So I'll go uh, into that in depth. So if you think about scheduling in a small practice like mine, so I have a three chair practice. Um, if I had a typical schedule, it might look something like this. I might have six patients uh, uh, in one column during the day and six in the other and, and maybe nine hygiene patients. Total of 21, okay? Um, but if you look at how I'm kind of rolling it out for teledentistry is I am not even in the office when the hygienist is doing hygiene, okay? I have the whole office to operate social distancing, okay? And I have aerosol treatment and treatment operatory number one. I have non-aerosol treatment and operatory two. I have a virtual operatory where I have synchronous visits scheduled. And then I have the hygiene operatory actually empty for spillover if I need to get somebody in, okay? And I have the hygiene uh, operatory illustrated in this diagram, but my hygiene is not even there while I'm in the office. I've been doing this for, I think, we're at like eight to 10 weeks now. So, um, and so doing it this way, I'm back up to around 19 visits. And so I'll show you what my schedule looks like in Dentrix. So this is an illustration from last week or two weeks, 10 days ago about. And so I have an aerosol producing uh, procedure uh, column where I have a closed operatory. It's my only closed operatory. And then I do my non aerosol procedures in another and then I have spillover patients uh, in op three, which is my hygiene operatory. But if you look to the right, I have asynchronous spots in my schedule, and that's my virtual operatory. Okay, so whenever someone wants a follow-up call or they need to um, schedule a synchronous visit with me, I have those kind of strategically spaced throughout my day so that I know that they're there and I can review the form they fill out ahead of time. And then I can pop in with a Zoom in my office and I can talk to the patient. Now, if you look at the bottom, this is where the efficiency comes in. So when you talk about asynchronous visits, um, asynchronous means that you don't have to be at the same place and time as the patient. So organizing those is a little bit of a challenge because you're we're used to operating within a schedule, okay? And asynchronous visits aren't confined to a schedule, okay? But how we do it to not lose track of them for billing purposes is whenever the hygienist saw them, um, like this is the 5th of August, she saw these patients, these eight to nine patients here, the day before in hygiene, and I'm reviewing all their records. Those are all periodic checkups and two new patients, okay? And so she's, doing those uh she's doing those on the day before and i am going to review all their clinical records in dentrix the next day when i get to the office and close out an exam and then my my treatment coordinator 
calls those patients back and goes through the scheduling process for them. So this is how I've been using Dentrix in the Dentrix scheduler to, uh, to um, have my hybrid um, schedule. This allows me to get up to close to what I was at before without having all the people. So if you can think about it this way, I don't have my hygienist. I don't have one of my secretaries uh, with me that day. And also all those patients aren't in the building that, that day. What I've come to find out is that it's very nice because i am got a lot of extra time to focus on the patients I'm doing treatment on. And between patients, I'm just doing asynchronous exams on patients and not having to go through um, and hop over, change PPE, talk to everybody. Um, I'm doing a review of their, their notes and records. So like I said about organizing, this is just a side note, but organizing asynchronous and follow-up visits requires maybe a little bit of, of operational um, consideration. So um, I use a, um, uh, a task management platform to organize my asynchronous visits. So you can see here, these I changed the names on these people here, but um, I have a way to organize my, my um, asynchronous visits in a queue. So um, these patients are all in queue and waiting for me. And so that I know that I have asynchronous visits to do. And so no one gets lost um, from schedule to schedule. Because like I said, when you're using the teledentist, doing asynchronous teledentistry in the schedule, um, you got to work through those as you go throughout the day, but you know, you might have gotten busy and you can't get to two or three of them. So they need to go into the next day so they don't forget about them. If I put them into this task manager, I know that I've um, finished them. And I also can put notes into this system that then go over to my treatment coordinator so that she knows exactly how to follow up with them. And we could communicate back and forth within this. So it's been really helpful, really handy. If you're interested in what it is, let me know. Just shoot me an email. Um, I was going to share with you a little bit about uh, my practice recovery. So my practice, like I said, is a small rural practice. I have three operatories. Uh, we're closed for about nine weeks. Uh, we did a little bit of minor construction, so it delayed us from opening. Uh, but we offer teledentistry uh, through triage only while I was closed. Um, I came in just a handful of times. Um, during during the lockdown. Um, and during all this, my part-time hygienist um, who was near retirement decided to retire. Okay, so I went from having um, two hygienists or two hygienists to one. In my new normal, all my patients are seen via hygiene assessment before they're even scheduled with me for treatment. Okay. Um, however, new patients, I've started shifting my new patients to see the doctor first. New patients are, especially adults, adult new patients are very difficult to do a teledentistry exam on. And I'm trying to grow my practice, so I want my new patients to come in and meet me. Um, but it works really great for st stable recall patients, and patients have been very, very, very happy to see that we're taking you know, their safety seriously, that we're getting them in, that we're available, that we're offering convenient hours for them. Um, and we went from being open three and a half days a week to being open four and a half days a week. But I'm only here Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday. And my hygienist is here Tuesday, Thursday, and every other Friday. And she stays late on one Tuesday because there's so much hygiene demand. And so I've shared with you a little bit of my um, analysis that I've done for my practice um, here. And what you can see is we're on par nationally with uh, the HPI. So at, they're saying that the ceiling for um, practices is somewhere around 80% of pre-COVID. That's what uh, I've been hearing in the uh, ADA webinars. Um, and that some practices are between seven, between that 70 and 80% is where they are in volume. And we are in that range at my practice. But I think what's different about my model that I'm doing here is that um, I'm implementing a lot of risk mitigation, um, new processes. And what we're seeing is that I'm seeing about the same amount of patients every day um, that are doctor patients. Um, but she, the hygienist, she's up 25% on the amount of patients she's seeing per day. Um, and 
with this staffing model where we're not all here at the same time and we're not having all the people here at the same time, both patients and staff, is that my staff hours per day are down 15% and my salary costs are down almost half, which is very was very interesting to find out. Um, and then um, what we found out is that with all this, my I'm about I'm down about 16% um, on my um, my my daily average charges um, between for June and July, um, comparing it to to last year same time. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about that is uh, we did a lot of ramp up. We implemented a lot of new systems. And so we're already seeing that we're going to be between uh, August and July, we're already going to be up 16 more percent. So we're getting, uh, we're moving in the right direction because we're getting more efficient using this system and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Um, and also I put a little productivity measure in there just to see labor productivity that comparing these uh, these models uh, from la last year to this year, it's almost the same, you know, the amount of charges per staff hour invested in um, to what we're doing. So pretty, pretty interesting preliminary findings. And, and I'm going to continue to um, review this and analyze it. But um, some other uh, interesting stuff here um, in 2019, I kind of showed here the different codes for asynchronous and asynchronous. I've been doing teledentistry for two years in practice, but really it was just to cover when I was out of town. So what with COVID, um, you could see in 2019, I did you know less than 40 teledentistry uh, evaluations in all of 2019. Um, in quarter one, 2020, before COVID, um, only five. And then in quarter two, we did, you know, almost 90 and already in quarter three, and we haven't even, uh, we're not even, we're at halfway right now. I'm at over 150 teledentistry exams. And I gave you the breakdown here of the evaluation I've been doing. Most of them are limited evaluations because I think there are some pent up uh, demand from COVID, obviously. Um, and then quite a bit of recall. And like I said, I've been doing some comp exams, but I'm going to be shifting those to um, to my schedule and then to my to my in person schedule. And then you've got the other just follow ups and things like that. So with that, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for your time. And we've got you know quite a bit, maybe 15 minutes for questions. So I'll pass that back to to Adam. And then if you want to participate in that survey, I'll put that survey link in into the chat if anybody would like to uh, participate in it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, like you said, we do have about 15 minutes left for questions. So if anyone has questions, type them into the Q&A or chat and we'll get to them as we can. First question is, how is taking pictures and videos with an intraoral camera considered teledentistry? Isn't teledentistry where you review patients' condition online? I, I guess what you're saying is, the person is asking is, is teledentistry just talking to somebody about their problem. That's one kind of teledentistry. It's what a lot of people's entry into teledentistry was, but for 10 years, there's been literature saying that you can review people and keep them in stable oral health, like stable oral, good oral health, using teledentistry, using your staff, using your other team members um, to maintain their oral health by doing checkups, using teledentistry. So I think that's what you're asking is, I thought you teledentistry was just like triaging them. It's more than that. There's lots of different ways you can implement it. In medicine, there's so many ways people are using teledentistry. Uh, what I think we've done a disservice of as a profession is getting the word out that, hey, you can use teledentistry and it means multiple things. And I think there's been a little bit of a failure to get the word out that teledentistry means more than just one thing. And I think that answers the question. Yeah. Um, how comfortable do you feel that you are not actually able to conduct an oral cancer exam by palpation? Yeah. So that's a common question that I get. I feel very confident, um, mainly because I've worked with eye hygienists for a long time and um, I know that they're adequately trained to do this. Um, and there's literature supporting this. Um, some of the, there's, three to five, uh, you know, sources that I can, I, I'm happy to share 
Um, if you want to email me, I can, I've got a list of the literature as it comes out, but, um, there was a study where like 300 people, um, in, uh, Europe across 10 different nursing homes were evaluated, um, using teledentistry just like this. And it was specifically to study oral cancer and whether or not they're finding pathologies. Um, and the, 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 the study was very very specific and, and had great great outcomes and so i think that it's a little bit of a paradigm shift but um in some ways um it's the same struggle that medicine had when you started using um you know your team members to help extend access to care to more than just the amount of people that can get in just to see the doctor and so making sure you have adequately trained team members to take pictures, notice when something is, is out of whack, document it and show you. But also a lot of it has to do with the, you know, you have to find out what diagnostic data you want to feel comfortable um, doing an evaluation. And there are diagnostic tools that you may want to implement that are related to oral cancer. Um, I don't do them because I feel very confident with my team member that we can communicate effectively on the condition of their oral, patient's oral health. Do your hygienists perform cleanings on the patients they triage for later use? Uh, hold on. Do your hygienists perform cleanings on the patients they triage for later use in asynchronous evaluation? So in, in Missouri, um, that's going to be to depend on state by state. So my, in, I'm in Missouri and my hygienist cannot do a, a, a preventive visit on a new patient. So I have, it has to, they, she can establish a new patient for me, um, but she can't do that first cleaning until I've done an, a, an exam on them, a teledentistry exam. Um, or in-person exam. So um, works great for recalls because they've already had, you've already established them as a patient and you know what kind of periodontal condition that they're in. Uh, but um, in my state, particularly, you that's the limitation. Um, I, hope that, I think that answers that question. Can you go over how you handle per periodic exams asynchronously? Yeah, so um, my hygienist, is scheduled with, um, she actually um, gets them done uh, faster than she would with, um, uh, if she was waiting for me, she jokes about that, that she's not having to wait for me anymore. So um, the visits, instead of, instead of an adult being scheduled for an hour, she's usually, they're usually out 45 to 50 minutes. So um, patient comes in, they um, get their health history reviewed, they get their um, x-rays taken, they get their tooth chart updated, they get their signs and symptoms documented, and then she does, um, if they're an existing patient, they get a cleaning. Um, and as she's doing that, she's you know keeping notes if she sees something to, uh, noteworthy. And then when she does the x-rays, if there is a tooth, we, like I said, I have a decision tree process. So if, if a tooth has a sign or a symptom, she takes a PA of that tooth. Um, in addition to the normal set of x-rays that she would normally do. Um, and then the other thing um, that she would do that's different is she takes a full set of orthodontic photographs. Um, uh, she does that. I, I'm moving towards uh, digital scans, hopefully soon, um, for all of my um, tele-industry patients uh, as well, because it just adds a little layer of, uh, of, of a view for me. Whenever we started the first teledentistry pilot um, at the health center I worked at, we did photographs first, intraoral photographs, and it was just too discombobulating. There was just, you couldn't, you know, it was this three or was it 14 or, you know, whatever. So uh, we quickly adopted the, the thought process of orthodontics photographs and then intraoral photographs of anything that's suspicious. Um, and then from there, sometimes um, she can take uh, impressions uh, for me. Uh, I don't have her take those on every patient. Um, and then from there, I, I, she does a very detailed note template that I created for her. Um, she goes through the template and she answers all those questions. And then, um, 
she closes that out and then I have it waiting for me to review the next day. If there is something urgent, um, they know my availability. And so if I'm available, sometimes I'll jump into a synchronous visit if I have the availability. Um, if it's somebody who had a problem and it's like a patient, you know, had some swelling or things like that, um, I'll jump in and do it earlier. Um, and then I'll figure out if I need to get them referred out that day or get an antibiotic. So I think that hopefully that answers that question. Can you review some of the platforms that you could do teledentistry through? I know a couple months ago when you did a webinar for us, you talked about you could use Zoom, for example. Um, are there other types of video services out there that you can do teledentistry yeah. through? So there's quite a bit. There's more now than there was before March. But um, so Zoom, Zoom works. Um, you can do um, teledent is a good one out there. So teledent. Um, is made by a mouthwash. They make the intraoral cameras that we use in my office. There's also um, just a slew of other brands. There's like, uh, I mean, I could just name off a few. There's Rhinogram, there's um, Opera DDS, there's um, Simplify, there's OrthoSnap. <laughs> there's just, there's a whole, there's a whole slew of of other programs out there. Um, it might surprise you that when you're doing asynchronous, almost all of what I do is just in Dentrix. Um, I do have a task manager that I use, um, but just to kind of keep track of stuff and communicate with my treatment coordinator. But I do almost all of it in Dentrix when you do the asynchronous. If you're gonna do a video chat system, you just need to you know, find a platform that works for your IT and your bandwidth and your price range. For a pediatric practice, or if you have pediatric patients, how would you handle teledentistry with them? Yeah, so um, the majority of the pilot program that we did uh, in my health center is we went to schools um, and did it. And so teledentistry, especially asynchronous teledentistry, um, works really great in two areas. Children, because the amount of imaging and x-rays is less. Um, and the treatment plans are a lot more straightforward um, than an adult with complex, um, complex issues because the restorative path for um, adult, an adult can go, you know, lots of places. So what, what we found is that, you know, pediatrics is also where a lot of the literature is. So if you look, um, if you look up teledentistry or virtual dental home by Dr. Glassman, you can find lots of examples of how they've been using it for over a decade to do um, uh, exams and maintain children uh, in particular. And then the other, the other application works really well for is um, stable adults on recall who just need, you know, they just need someone to check their teeth, make sure they're looking good and, um, and kind of get, get moving on because um, those stable low risk patients are, are, are great for teledentistry. Um, but that, that's how I would do it with the pediatrics. So the pediatrics, teledin, asynchronous teledentistry all the way. What are you charging for synchronous and asynchronous teledentistry? Yeah, so that's a common question. Um, you don't charge anything extra to do teledentistry, in my opinion, okay? You just charge for the evaluation that you do. So if, you're, if someone's gonna do... Um, if someone is coming in, they're getting a periodic exam. I'm telling, I can tell you one thing: I save money doing having them come in and do a teledentistry exam, asynchronous. So I'm not charging them extra for that. I am taking pictures, but I don't charge extra to take the pictures. You sure can take the charge of that. Um, I know a lot of practices that do um, charge for scans and and taking pictures, but um, I don't charge any extra to do a teledentistry exam. Um, the only thing that might seem like it's charging them more is, is when you do a limited triage, maybe before whenever someone called with an emergency, you just talked to them on the phone, you didn't charge them anything. Well, if you're doing it as a documented teledentistry exam, you can bill their insurance and you can bill for the D0140 and you can charge a limited evaluation for that. Um, but you have to receive a picture and, and, and do some notes for that to, 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 to do that process. And then the other thing that's interesting is like, I, 
sometimes patients come in and you do a consultation with them and you don't charge them anything for that. Same thing with tell you're not, you're not going to not have them come in the office and do it over virtual. And then now you're going to charge them. Um, in my opinion, that you're trying to be convenient for them, but it's convenient for you because they're not coming in you're not using PPE. Your secretary doesn't have to, you know, deal with them in the, at the front desk. And, and then you uh, have a body in the chair, um, all that kind of stuff. So I encourage you to think of it as a more of an efficiency thing than it is an extra thing that you should have to charge for. Can you charge for it? Absolutely. You can. For existing patients who need a hygiene check and you can only do it via asynchronous teledentistry, how do you prep them for the fee involved? So I think this person is thinking that I charge extra for it. I don't. So that person's coming in for a checkup, whether I'm there or I'm doing it with asynchronous teledentistry. I'm not charging the patient extra to do that. If you want to, and that's your business model, that, that's okay. I don't think that there's a need to do that because they're saving you, they're really saving you time. I am doing um, as good as the national average uh, or more. Um, and I'm doing almost as good as I was last year, the same time with the current circumstances. And I work a day or less in person. So I used to be in the office three and a half days a week. I'm here two and a half days a week. So, and my, my chair is full. My chairs are always full for four and a half days of the week doing it this way. And I don't think that you necessarily need to charge people for it. Um, and patients have been very accepting for it. Uh, that I do do as much same day treatment. Um, so that's not a problem, but since I'm doing this and after you go through the first few weeks of it, I'm booked up and I can't, and I'm booked up because of social distancing and, you know, having patient turnover be a little slower because of the, you know, the spacing of the timing. So it just it keeps my funnel going while I'm able to see the people I want to see. And then they refer out the stuff that I can't see. So I can keep my patients coming in for treatment um, and focus on that. If possible, do you encourage patients or even a family member to take pictures using their cell phone to text or email you as a way to follow up with a procedure? Yeah. So for follow-ups um, and emergencies. So if you were before COVID, people probably got, you know, especially if you had certain platforms like Weave or even some people would send stuff through like the office Facebook messenger and things like that. Um, they'd send it to the, to the office uh, Facebook page. Those are like, those are, you could encourage them to convert those into teledentistry. Just send them a form to fill out where they consent, all right? And they answer some questions and then they send the picture to you. And then you're able to go into Dentrix or whatever you use and document the, per, to the visit and close it up. So absolutely, those are, those are great. And for follow-ups, I don't usually charge for a follow-up on a treatment that I, I perform, procedure I perform, but um, I, so... I would encourage those follow-ups because it's saving you having to bring in another person while your staff's focusing on seeing the patients that need to get treatment. Um, highly recommend using it for follow-ups. Very efficient use of it. Lots of people are doing that these days. Right. And then we have time for one more question. Are there additional HIPAA considerations that need to be taken into account when using teledentistry? Uh, I wouldn't say there's additional HIPAA considerations right now with the pandemic. HIPAA was actually relaxed right now. So you can use some things to try teledentistry that you maybe not normally would have used. Okay. So for example, like Zoom has a HIPAA compliant version that costs more and a non-HIPAA compliant version. So you could under the and be covered by, you know, HHS is not going to enforce that because you're trying to reach your patients during the pandemic. So if you wanted to use the non-HIPAA compliant version to get started, go ahead and do it. And then once they say, hey, HIPAA's coming back on this date, you can move over to the HIPAA compliant if teledentistry works for you. Um, but I do want to encourage people, try asynchronous. It, it is a, an efficient way. There is a large percentage of your patients that you can see and maintain just by doing asynchronous. Um, and you don't have to go on and have 15, 20 minute Zoom call with somebody and burn up a lot of your time when your time is is a precious resource that is kind of hard sought right now because there's pent up demand 
and you have a lot of things, there's a lot of things in this new COVID world that you have to worry about. You don't have your have to have all of your time be on a synchronous uh, call. So highly recommend you try to try to consider that if a patient submits you or your hygienist sends you adequate diagnostic data that you lay out for your staff or the patient to fill out and send you, you can review that stuff that can count as an exam legally. And we're not the only specialty to do this, okay? Dermatology does this. Um, lots of other profession, uh, medical professions use asynchronous healthcare. Um, and I, I highly re recommend you do some research and look into it and think of it as a tool to help you manage that hybrid schedule so that you could see your patients, maintain your stable patients, and get back to a level where you can see enough people to feel like your um, um, your office is at, at the place where it needs to be at safely. Great. Um, had a couple questions about if you can um, drop a link in the chat for where attendees can access your forms. Um, so if you're able to do that, that would be appreciated. Yeah, just I'll drop that link in there. I also, just go to my website. I've got them on a page on my website. Um, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'll let you post that in the chat, um, but that'll do it for tonight's webinar. So thank you, Dr. Suter, for your presentation. And thank you to everyone for joining us. If we were unable to answer your question, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com or feel free to email Dr. Suter directly. His email address is on the screen. Everyone in attendance tonight will receive a link of the recording probably later this week. So check your email. On behalf of Henry Shine, thanks for joining us. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.